Welcome everybody to our weekly Bible study. It's good to have everybody back. Last week we finished our uh, part four of our study on divorce and remarriage in the prophets. And we're going to start by reviewing the final reference to divorce in the prophets in Malachi. So while everyone's getting settled, you want to turn to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi is right before Matthew. The last book of the Old Testament. And we'll start in Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. And it seems like everything's working now. And it seems like everyone's here. Yes, the microphone is on. In Malachi chapter 2, starting in verse 14, the prophet opens this section with a question as to why God is refusing the worship of His people. And the Lord answers, or the prophet answers, via the Holy Spirit, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet had he residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hates putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that you deal not treacherously." Malachi says, you have dealt treacherously, yet is she your companion and the wife of your covenant. He has made them one. Has he not made one? That says to me that even though you deal treacherously, she will still yet be the wife of your covenant and the wife of your youth. She's still your companion. In this case, it's the covenant God swore to Abraham regarding Israel. This again is, can be read in light of the, of the symbols in the romantic subtext. The, the issue of covenant swearing, by the way, and an oath, swearing a vow is going to come up in the study later tonight. And when it does, keep in mind that the marriage vow... The marriage vow is a covenant made before God. It is the swearing of an oath in order to receive the blessing of an ordinance that God created and that God owns, that being marriage. And this brings us to Esther. I'm sorry. And this brings us to Ezra. Now, as far as I can tell, Ezra is the only book in the section of the Bible that's called the Writings with a reference to divorce. And it's often referred to by Bible teachers when the question about the Bible and divorce are discussed. There is, by the way, uh, compelling scriptural and historic evidence that the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther are arranged in the English canon in reverse chronological order. Ezra and Nehemiah, by the way, is considered a single book in the Hebrew Tanakh. It's simply entitled Ezra, um, which would mean that the reverse order of these books um, may be a long-standing tradition, possibly even predating Christianity. Um, and I'll just give you some lines of evidence that the order is reversed. Uh, First, Esther marries the king of Persia after he divorces Queen Vashti, and she becomes Queen Esther in Esther chapter 2, verse 17. And then Nehemiah is commissioned to rebuild Jerusalem by the king of Persia, quote, with the queen sitting at his side, unquote, in in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 6. 
So why is the queen mentioned as sitting by his side and she's not named? She's, and why is the queen of Persia mentioned to Nehemiah's Jewish audience? I suggest it's because she is the Jewish queen Esther. And then when we read the book of Nehemiah, we see that Nehemiah learned from his fellow Jews in Nehemiah chapter 1 that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and the gates. And then the book of Nehemiah documents the rebuilding of the wall and the gates. And the whole rebuilding takes place in almost constant fear of invasion. And then Ezra arrives in Jerusalem in Ezra chapter 7. To, to specifically to rebuild the temple. And he faced considerable political opposition, but no threat of a physical invasion, indicating that the walls and the gates of the city were already in place from Nehemiah's efforts earlier. Um, then the culmination of the restoration of worship in Ezra without any concern for attack in chapter 3, indicates to me that the city was secured by walls and gates by the time Ezra rebuilt the temple and, and, and started worship again. And then historically speaking, from extra-biblical records, Bullinger's Persian Kings list, which you can find in Bullinger's Companion Bible, strongly suggests that the Persian king called Artaxerxes uh, married Esther before commissioning Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem. And the king called Darius was, in fact, the son of Queen Esther. Um, and that king commissioned Ezra to rebuild the temple. So why are the books presented in chronological, reverse chronological order? Well, I don't know. No one really knows for sure. But keep this reversal in mind as we study Ezra and the topic of divorce in general. All right, so if you have your Bible, turn to Ezra chapter 9. We're going to go back from Malachi, back to Ezra, to Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9, and we will start reading. Uh, in the very uh, in the very first verse. So Ezra 9 1. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, The people and of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the land, doing according to their abominations. So let's stop there. What are these things that are referred to as having been done? Well, if we go back to the end of chapter 8, we can read what these things are. In chapter 8, 36, we read that they delivered the king's commissions unto the king's lieutenants and the governors on this side of the river. Okay? So, so who are these princes that came to Ezra? Well, we're not told specifically who they were exactly, but... The chronological order of their arrival follows the delivery of the king's commissions to the king's lieutenants on this side of the river. So, what were the king's commissions? The king, well, we can read about that in chapter 7. We read in the letter, Ezra was to deliver from Darius to his lieutenants in the land. And I didn't write this verse down, I apologize. Um, it's in Ezra chapter 7, and it's the text of the letter that Darius gave to Ezra to be passed along to the lieutenants of the king of Persia in, in, in Ezra chapter 7, verse 11. We read, we read, And whatsoever more shall be needful of the house of God, which thou shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house. I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, shall require of you, that it be done speedily. So this message had recently been delivered, not to the leadership in Jerusalem, but to the leadership of the Persian Empire, ruling the lands around Jerusalem. 
the princes under Cyrus. I'm sorry, under Darius, king of Persia. So how did the rulers, how did the rulers beholden to the king of Persia view the Jews and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple? Do we know from the context of the story how the people around, the non-Jews, how they viewed the Jews and their return and their rebuilding, which, by the way, was earlier in the story in Nehemiah, if my assumptions that the books are reversed is correct. Well, we saw that Sanballat and Tobiah, they were making constant mischief against Nehemiah and the builders, even threatening them physically so that the builders had to stand guard part-time and build part-time, and everyone had to keep their sword on them full-time because they were in, in fear of being attacked, right? And we know from chapter 4, verse 5 in Ezra, that the adversaries of the Jews hired counselors against them to frustrate their purposes all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So the Jews' adversaries wrote letters to the Persian king and even got the construction halted at one point at the end of Ezra chapter 4. So why did the king of Persia read a letter from the Jews' adversaries? Why would he read that letter? It's because they worked for him. They were his princes and his ministers in the land. They're what's called vassals. They served at his pleasure. And the vassals of King Cyrus were like all vassals throughout all of history. They wanted to rule the land and collect the taxes and manage the treasuries themselves. That's what they really wanted. They would usurp authority from the king of Persia if they could. They just couldn't. But they didn't want any more competition than they already had. So they were resistant to the Jews returning at all. And if they couldn't stop them from returning, you can be assured that they wanted to destabilize them and their government. And now here in Ezra chapter 9, it seems that these princes, the adversaries of the Jews, have brought certain intelligence to Ezra. So imagine, after being told they were to assist these people that they hated, in order to accomplish their establishment in the land, which would diminish their wealth and their power. They just got this letter from the king saying, you're going to do this whether you like it or not. Right after that, they, they show up and they're suddenly concerned for the purity of the people, and especially the priests and the leaders of the Jews, according to the Jewish law. Well, why would pagan princes suddenly care about the Jewish law against marrying pagan wives. And why were they bringing this accusation to Ezra? Well, I believe it was because they're trying to destabilize the situation, and I assume it's because they remember what Nehemiah had done back in Nehemiah chapter 13. If you want to go um, actually forward in the book, but back in the story, to Nehemiah chapter 13, we'll read that Nehemiah had removed similar offenders in his days when he discovered that certain of the people had married foreign wives. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 13, and we'll start in verse 26. If you have your Bible, go to Nehemiah 13, 26, where we read, quote, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these, th by these things? Yet among many nations... Was there no king like him who was beloved of God, and God made him king over all Israel? Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Shall we then, says Nehemiah, hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was even the son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite. Nehemiah is outraged here. Therefore, says Nehemiah, I chased him from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. 
Thus I cleansed them from all strangers and appointed the wards of the priests and the Levites, everyone in his business. So Nehemiah removed the offenders and, to, and appointed their wards in their place, meaning he appointed the younger men coming up under the leaders into their positions of authority because they had profaned the priesthood. They were removed. And, and, and he mentions Solomon in this verse. Do you remember the judgments God brought against Solomon for what he had done in 1 Kings chapter 11, if you want to go back? Go back uh, to 1 Kings chapter 11. And we'll read what happened, what God's judgment was against Solomon for this same sin of marrying foreign wives. In, in 1 Kings 11, starting in chapter 11, we read, Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee. I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and I will give it to thy servants. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. So God rejected Solomon from his position of authority for marrying strange wives and following their gods. And so Nehemiah here at the return, followed that precedent. And he removed the offenders in his day. And now it seems that the adversaries of Ezra saw an opportunity to destabilize the nascent government being reestablished in Jerusalem by forcing this issue in front of Ezra, probably hoping to affect a similar purge of the leadership. The, the religious and, and, and political leadership that was coming together in Jerusalem. And when Ezra realizes that the accusation is true, he spends the whole rest of Ezra chapter 9 praying to God for direction. He's repenting and apologizing and telling God how sorry they are and how filthy they are and how horrible they are. And he's asking God for guidance. But who is it that actually gives Ezra instruction regarding what to do about the foreign wives. Let's read it. Let's go to Ezra chapter 10. Ezra chapter 10. And we'll start in verse 1. If you have your Bible with you, go to Ezra chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Now, when Ezra had prayed, and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children. For the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born to them according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongs unto you. We also will be with you. Be of good courage and do it. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel to swear that they should do according to this word, and they swore. So, I ask, who was discovered to be in the trespass? Who is named as having married foreign wives? Well, in chapter 10, we get the entire list of every one of them. And notice in Ezra chapter 10 and verse 26, Ezra chapter 10, verse 26, we'll read it together.
And of the sons of Elam, Mataniah, Zechariah, and Jehiel. So did you get that? Jehiel is named as an offender. And then his son, Shechaniah, suggested the oath be sworn to divorce the women and, by the way, to disinherit the children. So I propose that, Shechaniah, that, that, that the command to divorce the women and disinherit the children did not come from God. In fact, it came from Shechaniah, who made a proposition in order to keep his father in his position and to eliminate any potential rivals for his own inheritance among his father's pagan wife's children. And he did it by suggesting they take a vow. Shechaniah used the letter of the law to persuade Ezra, who we're told was an expert in the law. So if you want to go to Numbers chapter 30, we'll see what the law says about a vow. If you want to go back there, Numbers chapter 30. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond... He shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. There you go. So this command is repeated, by the way, in Leviticus 30, verse 2, in Deuteronomy 23, 21, and it's even reiterated by Solomon in Ecclesiastes 5. These are all texts that Ezra would have been expert in. And so Ezra went along with the vow. Now, we know that, that Jesus warns men against swearing to God, right? And, and, and we know that, remember Jephthah, who swore a foolish vow that entrapped his own daughter back in Judges 11, right? Saul made a presumptuous vow in 1 Samuel 14 that ensnared his own son, Jonathan, with the eating of the honey. And, and Peter, by the way, swore an oath that he did not know Jesus Christ in Matthew 26. And remember, 40 men swore an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul in Acts chapter 23. And like I said, Jesus advised people against swearing at all in Matthew chapter 5. So just because all of Israel swore an oath to do this or that doesn't necessarily mean that any of this came from God. And then, now as we read here in the story of Ezra, we'll hear nothing from God. We'll hear nothing from a seer or a prophet. Who are we going to hear from? We're going to hear from the guilty men in the story and their Jewish family members who insist themselves to Ezra that they must swear an oath and that they must put put away their wives and the children born to them. Remember, in light of the the law, the Jewish law of the firstborn, all the sons of the preeminent Jewish leaders, they didn't want to have other offspring, perhaps even a firstborn son of of the pagan wife. They didn't want to have to contend for their inheritance with the firstborn of a foreign wife. So it was better in the mind of Shechaniah that he instigate a vow that gets rid of both problems. The precedent of his dad maybe losing his position and the threat of any other siblings as to taking any of his inheritance. And of course, they insist that Ezra must oversee it and that it must be done immediately. After all, this is now a vow and a vow has to be honored according to the law. Right? But was the command to divorce from God? And were the divorces done according to the law? The scripture says no on both accounts. No detail of nor lawful instructions for the administration of this mass divorce event are given. 
And having reviewed the law, we now understand that there are no legal instructions for divorce according to the law. They don't exist. The act of a man writing a certificate of divorce based on his own testimony alone is the closest thing we've read, but this is not a lawful act. We know that a lawful act requires two or three witnesses, according to Deuteronomy 17. We also know that many acts of the priests and the prophets and the leaders recorded in Scripture were in error, or even ungodly, wicked, even evil. So you would think because a priest oversaw everything and there was a, a, a vow sworn and an oath taken that surely this is of God. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Ezekiel 22, if you want to... Uh, you don't have to turn there because we, we'll, this will this will take all night. Um, but if you go to, not Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 5.31, the prophet's recounting the litany of reasons that God is angry with his people, right? And in Jeremiah 5.31... Uh, God is threatening them with destruction and captivity, and he says the following, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their own means, and the people love to have it so. Jeremiah 5.31. Similarly, in Ezekiel 22.26, we read the prophets recounting of God's displeasure with both the religious and the political leaders, which in Israel were one. And Ezekiel records, Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Sabbath. And I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. That's the princes and the priests. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 3, God testifies, Against Israel, through Zephaniah, he says, Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the marrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. So there you have everyone. The princes, the judges, the prophets, and the priests all condemned. And here in the book of Ezra, we encounter priests... Princes, prophets, judges, all set apart by God to reestablish Jerusalem after they've suffered the punishment of the captivity brought about by what? By the wickedness of their forefathers, the priests and the prophets and the, and the princes. Now, the scripture doesn't indicate that Ezra himself has had his heart set in wickedness like those before. In fact, he doesn't. But as always, the people did. And Ezra was in error here. And given the history of, of even those who were ordained and chosen and set apart for the work of the Lord to be in error, and I mean even Moses and even David and even Solomon, it should come as no surprise that the people were wicked and that Ezra, their priest, was not without fault. And so I want to give a few other lines of evidence to consider that this was not of God, and that this was an error. Uh, Ezra appears to have been interrupted as he prayed to God for guidance. He was interrupted by a mass of people in, in a socially, politically, and even personally explosive situation. Many of the men found to be in the trespasses, they were older than him, and they were prominent in the community. They had returned to the land earlier than he did. They were, they were thought to be someone. And I submit that Ezra was persuaded by them, not by God, not even a prophet of God, to swear an oath and then to administer these divorces and disinheritance of the children, by the way. Nowhere in uh, another line of evidence, nowhere in the text of Ezra or anywhere else in the Bible does God command the divorce of a foreign wife, uh, nor does he suggest or bless anything like this episode of mass divorce of the wives and disowning of the children. Nowhere. And, by the way, there were men present who appear to have opposed the idea of the mass divorce. They're mentioned by name in Ezra 10, 15. So if you want to go back to Ezra, we'll go back to uh, Ezra chapter 10. And uh, we'll start in verse 15. 
Ezra chapter 10, verse 15. Are, are there, is there any other translations here? Anybody got the New King James? You got the New King James? Okay, then this will be obvious to you. Okay, we'll read this. Um, uh, Ezra 10, 15. Only Jonathan, the son of Asahel, and Jehaziah, the son of Tikva, were employed about this manner, and Meshulam and Shebathai, the Levite, helped them. So that's the King James translation. They, the King James translates that Asahel and Jehaziah were employed about this manner, the implication being that they, were, they helped. They were employed in the administration of the divorces. While the other two helped them, right? But the New King James and all the other modern translations record that Asahel and Jehaziah opposed this or stood against this and that the two others gave them support. And so, which translation is correct? The King James only is going to say, well, the King James is obviously correct. Well, I'm a King James first. I like the King James. I'm not King James only. And so we're going to look at translations. But first, I want to give you an admonition about going to the Hebrew and the Greek when studying the Bible. When someone teaching from the Bible goes to the Hebrew or Greek to try and understand the meaning of a word more precisely or to find the most precise meaning between various translations or to make sense of a, of a com confusing a passage, well, that can be helpful, especially when the original languages help align the passage with other passages that much more clearly establish a map. But when a teacher seeks to reverse the commonly accepted meaning of a word or a phrase, or especially when a teacher seeks to reverse the unestablished doctrine, be suspicious and don't accept his expertise, he is automatically suspect. And so, I advise you to be suspect about what I'm about to go into, because it has the potential to overturn a teaching often cited to support what some people believe is a biblical doctrine. That doctrine is called the Doctrine of Biblical Grounds for Divorce. Or, or, or at least to overturn the idea that God has specifically commanded divorce in specific situations. And while what I'm about to go through does not completely reverse the King James translation of all the words specifically, it essentially reverses the inference one takes from the passage. Um, but I would say the context of the rest of the passage supports that these men actually stood against the divorces and that they were not employed in administering them. In fact, let's go to Ezra 10, 16. If you're already there, if you're already in uh, Ezra 10, just hop ahead to verse 16, right? And we'll see that the four men referenced in the King James Version as having been employed or helping with administering these divorces are not mentioned when the Scripture actually records who administered the divorces. And this, this is just a few sentences later, right? Um, and I said it was Ezra 10 starting in 16, is that right? Yeah, Ezra 10. 16, and the children of the captivity did so. And Ezra the priest, with certain chief of the fathers, after the house of their fathers, and all of them by, by their names, were separated and sat down in the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. So why would the scripture credit the four men mentioned with having been employed in helping with the divorces yet then list Ezra and the chiefs of the fathers as having actually administered them. So that reads as redundant yet incomplete at best, and at worst, it's a disagreement in the text as to who was actually employed in, in administering and helping with the divorces. And so there's that. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't read well. And then, and then what can we gain from reviewing the Hebrew? Well, the Hebrew word translated as were employed in the King James Version is amaud, 
which means to stand or to take a stand. And it can be translated as to be employed. And the word translated as helped is azor, which means to help or support. So the Hebrew could go either way. Based, You'd have to make a judgment based on the context. Um, elsewhere in the King James Version, the phrase is translated as stood against in Judges 6.31. And Joash said to all that stood against him. It's the same term. Um, and that's the only other place in the Bible I could find that exact phrase, by the way. But in Genesis 19.27, we read that Abra Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And again, we see the Hebrew amau translated as stood. And so based on these other instances of the phrase, and because verse 16 and 17 name the administrators as other people, I judge that the four men singled out in the previous section took a stand against the decision for divorce and disinheritance, and that's why they were mentioned. A few other points to consider. Um, the, these, these leaders had married foreign wives and a marriage, by the way, is an oath. It's a vow, right? Well, in similar to fashion to what had happened with Joshua's treaty with the Gibeonites, remember Joshua made a treaty with the Gibeonites who had deceived him, right? Well, in similar fashion to what happened there, Ezra never really fully inquired of the Lord in, in a similar way that Joshua never did. Before he went through with this vow, this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this treaty with the Gibeonites. So Ezra never got word from the Lord or from the prophet or from the seer. And remember, the Lord never insisted that the Israelites break Joshua's treaty with the Gibeonites. Even though that treaty, the fact that they had taken such a vow and made such a treaty was the beginning of Israel... It was the beginning of them failing to cleanse the land of all the pagans. But God didn't tell them to break the treaty. Marriage is a vow sworn to God. So by the letter of the law, that vow would have stood against any vow to break it. And as to this, this idea that there's a command to separate from pagans, there is a command to keep themselves from pagans and from following their gods. But, if, but upon conversion, Rahab and Ruth were actually allowed into Israel. In fact, they were allowed into the lineage of the Messiah. And they were pagan women, but they were converted. And earlier in Nehemiah, as I said, um, we, worship, we witnessed worship of the people with their wives and children, who we were told in, in Nehemiah chapter 9, 2, separated themselves from all the... <clears throat> separated themselves from all the foreigners. So, but there was no command for divorce, right? Even though there were prophets among them, indicating that there was either demotion or disfellowship of those who were found in that trespass, but there's no record of any putting away or any divorce or any disinheritance in Nehemiah. <clears throat> I would say that perhaps if Ezra had continued seeking God's counsel in the temple the Lord would have suggested a process of disfellowship or a pursuit of conversion of the wives and the children rather than a mass divorce and disinheritance. But finally, no, this isn't finally. I got one more point after this. But instead of inquiry to the Lord in the temple, we read that Ezra went into the chambers of Johanan, the son of Eliashib. Well, who's that? Well, Eliashib is again one of the fathers named in the trespass as having taken a foreign wife. Eliashib, remember, his own son had married into the family of Sanballat, the enemy of the rebuilding earlier in Nehemiah. <clears throat> so Ezra received his counsel, not the counsel of the Lord, not the counsel of a prophet, and then finally, there's the fact that there were innocent children involved. Um, and, and in fact, that's the final statement in the story. Ezra 10.44, the, the last verse of the book, 
All these had taken pagan wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. So why is this fact reiterated as the final statement of the book? Well, to get an idea of why that might be, let's take a look at the final passage in the story of Jonah. Jonah, if you can get to it. Go to the final chapter of Jonah. Jonah is one of the small books of the prophets toward the end. Obadiah, Jonah. Okay, we're going to go to Jonah chapter 4, the final verse. Jonah 4.11. When God explained to Jonah why it pleased him not to have to destroy the city, right? The Lord said, And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left? And then he mentions the livestock. But similarly, in the final passage of Ezra, God purposely records the fate of the children involved. Just as the final passage of Jonah was meant to draw our attention to God's righteousness, I believe Ezra closed with the reference to the innocent children to draw attention to the injustice that had been done. The scripture clearly shows that this episode of mass divorce in Ezra was in fact not commanded by God, nor was it done according to the law. This was Ezra suffering of the people to be adjudicated short of what the law commanded. Why? Because of his own human frailty and his weakness and his inability to keep God's law perfectly. Just like Moses, right? Moses suffered them to divorce their wives instead of pursuing every case of alleged infidelity to its just end, which would have been an investigation and, and either the death penalty or the clearing of the accused. Well, <clears throat> in, in fact, just like Nehemiah, Nehemiah fired and banished the previous batch of offenders instead of investigating and prosecuting them as the law required. Nobody kept the law. Nobody followed through with the law the way God wrote it. The whole story of Israel <laughs> is a story that proves that neither they nor any other people, us included, could ever keep God's law. And so now this whole episode of Ezra, Nehemiah, and the divorce in general warrants more study, but uh, I'm just going to, I'm convinced of three things. There was no command from God to divorce and disinherit. The divorces were not carried out according to the law. And Ezra chapter 10 should not be referred to in a discussion of the so-called biblical grounds for divorce. <clears throat> All right. Now, as best I can tell in my research, the rest of the section of, Bi of the Bible that's called the writings contains no references to divorce. Although, Lamentations may be considered the bill of divorce that God wrote against his wife, Israel, in the romantic subtext. In fact, if you read chapter 3 of Lamentations, let's go there. Lamentations chapter 3. Here we go. Lamentations, uh, we're not told who the author of Lamentations is, I don't think, although it's commonly understood to be Jeremiah. Um, <clears throat> when you read Lamentations chapter 3, it reads like the Lamentations of a wife who's been cast away. Um, go to Lamentations chapter 3 and starting in verse 2. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me is he turned he turns his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin has he made old. He has broken my bones. He has builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He has set me in dark places, and they that be dead of old, as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. It's the bill of divorce. And that's the sound of a, of a forsaken wife. 
But in the midst of the recitation of the certificate of divorce, here in Lamentations, God informs men that he has the righteous authority to put his adulterous wife away. Why? Why does God have the right to divorce, but men don't? Why does God have the authority to put his wife away, but he never gave men that authority? I'm not saying men didn't take that authority and usurp that. I'm saying God never gave it to them. But why does he have it? Well, because he has the authority and the love and the power to redeem her and take her back. That's why. Lamentations 3, uh, hop ahead to, ver to, to verse 22. Lamentations 3, 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. So even in the, even in the certificate of divorce, God proclaims his ultimate purpose, which is to redeem her and to take her back. And so that concludes the law and the prophets. And now that's going to lead. We now turn to the, a study of the New Testament. New Testament references to divorce. And we are going to get to the primary passages that are cited whenever a modern Bible teacher addresses the topic of biblical grounds for divorce. Or I think, I think most Christians consider it a doctrine, a valid doctrine, biblical grounds for divorce. And those passages that everyone cites, they're the words of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. And, and they're, you know, the fact that the words of Jesus Christ are the primary verses that support the doctrine of biblical grounds for divorce speaks to, well, it's, it's no surprise because the church in general they insist upon placing doctrinal emphasis on the words of Jesus Christ. And they insist upon it so much that all of us have grown up with Bibles, one sort or another, with the red letters. The red letters are the words Jesus spoke during his earthly ministry. And why did the modern church put the letters in red? Because the modern church is confused and they think that the words Jesus spoke on during his earthly ministry are our primary instructions for morality and how we should live and salvation and everything else. My pastor, Bob Enyart, he used to say that all the letters of the whole Bible should be in red because they were all inspired by the same author. And if they were all in red, people would understand that while it was always the same author writing the book, every word was not intended as doctrinal instruction for every reader, especially today. Bob and I and many others understand that rightly dividing the word of truth is essential to understanding the instructions God has for us today. And the means of salvation that he wants us to preach today. If you want to preach the means of salvation today to a lost person, you will not find them in the red letters that Jesus spoke while he walked on the earth. You will not find them. But the church is obsessed with the red letters. But there were instructions intended for other people at other times in different circumstances and rightly dividing means understanding that. And I would add, by the way, understanding how to rightly divide passages that are symbolic and not necessarily meant as doctrinal instruction for anyone. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll just start with the New Testament. Um, turn to Matthew chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 18. 
Matthew chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 18. Now, <clears throat> the beginning passages of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, refer almost immediately to divorce. And the implication is clear that a man wishing to divorce his wife or his betrothed could write out a certificate of divorce of his own accord and he could do it in secret. How do we know that? Well, Matthew 1, starting in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. That's divorce. He was thinking, I'll divorce her secretly. Now, we've already seen that the Scripture establishes that no legitimate legal action against a person can be carried out on the testimony of one witness. Deuteronomy 17, 6. Uh, nor, by the way, can, can a legitimate legal action be carried out against a person in secret. Numbers 35, 12. Meaning that however divorce was viewed by Joseph or Matthew, or how it was employed in ancient Jewish society, it was in fact illegitimate. It was illegitimate. In fact, it was declared violence by God through Malachi, as we saw at the very beginning of this study. And I would, I would, I would remind you that by the letter of the law, divorce was a subversion of the law. And a subversion of the law was a capital offense, according to Deuteronomy 17, 12. If you will not obey the words of this, the priests... You're to be put to death. So divorce was a death penalty offense. Just to set aside the law and do what you want to do in secret based on your own testimony is subversion of the law. And I would posit that that's a death penalty offense according to the law. All right. And now Mary is the epitome of the wife of a man's youth as mentioned by Malachi. And of course, Mary was not guilty of adultery. But God knew that Joseph was subject to the same flaws as his father's in refusing to follow the law, and he was considering divorcing her. God knew that. And so what did God do? Before any divorce could take place, or even if Joseph had decided to go by the law and ask for an inquiry against his wife, before any of that, before there was any uh, public examination, the angel of the Lord told Joseph that she was with child by the Holy Spirit. And so, of course, Joseph did not divorce Mary. <clears throat> but they, were not married. they were not married, but they were betrothed, which is the same. In, 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 Israel, in, in the Jewish law, a betrothed wife was considered the same as a wife. If she had been unfaithful, the law had a specific thing that was supposed to be, she was supposed to be investigated. If she was guilty, she was supposed to be stoned. Joseph didn't want to make her a public spectacle. And, and, and the, the text of Matthew even presents that as if he was trying to do her a nice, oh, he was a just man. He didn't want to make her a spectacle. He was, in fact, subverting the law, which technically was a death penalty offense. But then again, everything all of us have ever done from Israel all the way to, the, to today, it's all technically a death penalty offense. That's why we all deserve death. That's why we all need salvation. And so Joseph did not divorce Mary based on the testimony of the second witness. Um, and this brings us to the statements Jesus made in reference to divorce in the Gospels. So we're going to look at them. We're going to look at Matthew 5, Matthew 19, and Mark 10. If you want to read ahead, read ahead because we're going to pick these up next week these being the primary sources of all the teaching that I'm aware of regarding the New Testament biblical grounds for divorce. And so we're going to look at them. Uh, Matthew 5, Matthew 19, 
Mark 10. These, they're being the red letters, by the way. So we'll pick that up next week. And until then, may the grace of God go with you, and may the peace of Jesus Christ be upon you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the law and the prophets and the writings and, and the New Testament written in your blood and for the whole Bible and for your testimony to the world. And thank you for the salvation of your son, Lord. The more we read about the history of humanity, the, the more we realize we, we need you. And, and we realize how merciful you have been and how graceful you've been to pardon such a such a, a, an incredible array of, of despicable things, Lord. We're just thankful and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to better understand your word. And we look forward to studying all this week and getting together again next. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.